So I'd like to begin by welcoming you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to explain the leading forms of psychological therapy to the average person. We will be doing that by interviewing the professionals who develop those therapies so we can better understand when to use them and how to get the most out of therapy. Today, I am honored to welcome Dr. Michael Kerr, who in 1990 succeeded Dr. Murray Bowen as director of the Georgetown Family Center and served in that role until 2010. Dr. Kerr is now the director of the Bowen Theory Academy in Islesburg, Maine. Dr. Kerr co-authored with Dr. Bowen the seminal book, Family Evaluation, An Approach Based on Bowen Theory, which is used by therapists all over the world to improve the lives of their patients. I encourage you to read Dr. Kerr's new book, Bowen Theory Secrets, Revealing the Hidden Life of Families, which was released in February 2019. Dr. Kerr was also the founding editor of Family Systems, a journal of natural systems thinking in psychiatry and the sciences. Dr. Kerr, welcome to The Therapy Show. Well, thank you very much. Hello. So, Dr. Kerr, can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led you to your work in family systems therapy? A couple of steps. I didn't understand where they were going to lead me when it happened. But the summer before I went to medical school uh, was an up, a time of upheaval for the family. My father had died suddenly in May of 1962. And during that summer, one of my older brothers who lived with my mother, and I was staying with my mother home from college, began to act out quite a bit. Another brother and I decided we needed to get some help. Anyway, my brother was diagnosed to be schizophrenic and hospitalized back in uh, that summer. So I went to medical school with that experience in mind. So I was particularly interested in psychiatry lecturers right from the get-go, along with the other disciplines in medicine. And most of them thought of the mothers of schizophrenic as hostile, underlying hostility and inadequately really providing love and security to their offspring. And I knew that wasn't my mother. I, I had seen, I know my mother and she wasn't like that. And then in my junior year, I had the good fortune of hearing Murray Bowen give a lecture, basically about the findings from his family study project had done a few years earlier before he left the National Institutes of Mental Health and came to to Georgetown. And, uh, And he described the family of a schizophrenic person and the mother in particular in an amazingly neutral way that really appealed to me and emphasized her over-involvement, her, he called it maternal instinct run amok, which is is a term I kind of like. I said, well, that's my mother. I mean, she was warm-hearted, a good person, very, very, very involved with my brother in a way that I came to understand was heavily driven by anxiety. So eventually, I wound up deciding to take a psychiatric residency, try it for a year and see what I thought, looking for a broader view of the individual. But then I began starting to run into Murray Bowen again. I remembered that lecture, eventually sought him out as a psychiatric resident to give me supervision in dealing with families. And once I started with him, I mean, I just, that's the direction that I wanted to go. It's systems, ideas, and relationships. Looking at the relationship system was hugely, made huge sense to me. So how would you briefly explain family systems to a non-professional? Well, I think it begins with the idea it's possible, it's achievable to have a science of human relationships. I remember giving a talk in Houston many years ago, and I showed a videotape clip with a mother I had interviewed. Anyway, there's a physician in the audience that said, uh, Dr. Kerr, what you're talking about is trying to find a science of human relationships. I said, you nailed that one. Meaning relationships could be something you could be ob- more objective about. No matter how chaotic a family is, if you uh, know the theory that family systems therapy is based on, which is a systems theory, it can enable you to step back and see a larger picture. Bowen once used the analogy, instead of watching a football game from the sideline, go up to the top 
top of the stadium and watch from up there. And you get a very different view of how things are playing out on the field. And it's the same with uh, family theory. It's, uh, it's an effort to show people ideas, acquaint people with ideas that help them see the relationship system of a family in ways that are much broader than we currently have in conventional theories. And so you're trying to then apply that knowledge. There, the theory has eight concepts in it, and the concepts are about what you can observe in a family system, certain kinds of patterns that, that can describe these things well enough that you can hear about it, you can learn about it, and then go try to observe it in your own life and in the lives of a family that you may be treating. And uh, systems theory becomes a lens for looking at things that helps you see things you didn't see before. And you mentioned the triangle? Yeah, the triangle would be one such concept. One way to understand the triangle is gossip systems. That's triangling. It's an anxiety-driven process. And gossip can be very helpful for a social group to spread useful information. But anxiety can also take over and affect how people are talking about one another and interacting with one another. Bowen got the first glint of triangles when he was doing his training at Menninger Clinic. And then after training, he was working there for a number of years on staff. And he realized when he took a trip away for maybe a week or even a little longer, that there was an individual back at Menninger's that he had been thinking very negatively about. And he said to himself, why, why am I thinking so negatively about that person? And he hadn't realized that until he got away. And he came back to Menninger's with a certain resolve to do something about that. Parks in the parking lot his first day back, and a colleague, faculty colleague, comes over from his getting out of his car and says, Murray, glad to see you back. I want to tell you what's happened with so-and-so since you've been here. And he gives him a negative story about this guy. And Bowen starts to feel negatively about this guy again without really realizing what had happened until the next time he went away. <laughs> and the physical distance can sometimes help people think a little more clearly. And that's really the, one of the first glimpses he had of the how a triangling process where one person is anxiously talking to you and telling you stories about another person can influence your ideas about the other person in a way uh, you hadn't realized. For example, a mother can convince a father that what their son or daughter is doing is because of their particular psychological problem. And then father can wind up going along with it, sympathetically supporting his wife and this idea. And that can become a triangle that when these kids grow up and start rebelling, they say it's two against one in this family. And it is. Two people can see the world in the same way and see the problem as in you. And that's anxiety uh, driven. So anyway, that would be one example of trying to take a concept that implies that each relationship the mother's relationship with the son or daughter cannot be adequately understood without understanding the relationship between the two parents or between the father and the son as well, her daughter. And when people can see that and see that they're all part of the problem, it can be uh, a, it's more objective, according to Bowen theory. And they can use that knowledge to work on trying to change themselves and and uh, for example, when Bowen was doing an inpatient family study project at NIMH, he there was he gave the example of a father who began to see what was going on in the family between him, his wife, and their schizophrenic daughter, and he began to think that the way the mother was responding and dealing with the daughter was part of the problem the daughter was having. And so when the mother turned to him for support. He was able to say, no, I'm not going to continue doing that. I think this is something you and our daughter need to work out between you. And it wasn't said in a critical way. And so he saw the triangle and then used that knowledge to work on changing himself and not continually 
siding with his wife to focus on the problem being in the daughter. So that's uh, that's enough to explain it. it never is, but uh, I love the way you explain both you know the family systems and the social system. And I think a lot of people can relate to both, like the being in a family, but also with that gossip example. I think that's really brilliant. Um, so when and how did you realize that family systems therapy would be an effective form of therapeutic intervention? Well, I would say most importantly was hearing the ideas and then trying to apply them to my own family of origin, particularly in the beginning, and realizing that using these ideas, I could see things happening that I hadn't realized were happening that were a source of anxiety for me and when I was anxious for the family. Say an example would be uh, most important insights I had in the beginning was I was meeting with Dr. Bowen regularly on Mondays and I was planning a trip home in about two weeks, which was north to Philadelphia area from Washington, where I would see my mother, uh, my then diagnosed schizophrenic brother, and my oldest brother and his wife and kids. And we would be together there for that weekend. And I was talking to him about it before I went. And I forget all the things he was suggesting or about how to think about the situation while I'm in it. And uh, so I went and had a visit. And then I came back and saw him on a Monday morning after returning. And I can still remember meeting at his office. I started talking and talking and talking and talking. I think I went on for somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. And I looked up at Murray Bowen, and he had a slight smile on his face. And I'm thinking, what the hell is this man smiling at? This ain't funny. <laughs> That's what I said to myself. And, and then I realized how anxious I was and how anxious I had been when I was home over the weekend and responding to what was going on in the family system. And that was my first inkling of what it would look like to be home with the family and not so caught in the system, that anxiety was a key variable and that that could then have a constructive effect on you, but also on your family, not to get caught up in the swirl of family tensions and join in to add to the problem. And the, the fun thing for me was Bowen hadn't said a word. He just he just related to me without getting caught up in my anxiety. And it re reflected in his facial expression. And I learned so much from that. And then subsequently was able to begin to do that sort of thing, to begin to, to have particularly visits from mother, which she would come to Washington and begin to see interactions and how anxious I was in dealing with mother and, and we could make changes in how I was uh, behaving. And that involved not blaming her for it and not blaming me for it, but it was something we created together. And anthropologist Barbara King likes the term co-create, coined that term from studying gorilla mothers and their, and their offspring, young offspring, and how they, the interaction between them is co-created. They, they, they're acting and reacting in response to each other in a generally useful way when the infant is that dependent on the mother. But I began to see that in the, in the family. It was something co-created. And if I could just be there without getting caught up in the anxiety of the system, it was constructive for me and constructive for the family. So it was one experience like that after another over time. And my knowledge of theory was additive. I mean, you don't, you see a little bit, there's a lot you don't see, and then you keep at it and you see a little bit more, a little bit more depending on the relationship, et cetera. So what's the average length of treatment for somebody working with a family systems therapist? Well, it's, I'd say that when I read this question earlier before I, we talked, I'd say there, there's no average. I mean, every situation is different. I've seen families one time, they got a lot out of it in the sense of uh, by interviewing the family in a way that helped them try to think a little more objectively. Uh, I remember one woman, uh, she said, uh, Dr. Kerr, after talking for this almost hour and a half, was it one session, I often do a longer session the first time, and she said, I think I realize from talking about it and responding to your questions that I have been way overdoing for my 
son. She had a son at the university that was struggling and, and she was wanting to be helpful and he was not getting anywhere. She said, I think what I need to do is just go back home and have some confidence that he can work his way out of this. She left the session a lot calmer than when she came in, let's put it that way, and it helped her think more clearly. And then I had other people, including myself, that's worked on this for a lifetime, really. And there's still more work to be done. There's always, it's hard to become a more mature person. And that's really the goal here is to become a more mature person. And, and it's not easy to do. And the theory sort of helps you understand what gets in the way. Uh, and you can change within limits. Nobody's going to remake themselves. It doesn't work that way. But so I have people I've worked with for many, many years on an infrequent basis, maybe once a month, four times a year, something like that, who want to stick with it because life goes on. So often people, when they're presented with a difficult set of circumstances, it truly is, Obama said this when he was president, it's potential, he called it teachable moment. But people who've struggled to see things when there's a, 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 a crisis in the family can often then see things they didn't see before. Suddenly it becomes clear. And uh, that's kind of a rising out of the mist and, and seeing with much more clarity. And, and that, that can take time to get those situations to unfold. And so it's, a, it's an individual choice how long people stick with it. Again, I think bottom line, it's hard to grow up for all of us. And we're not grown up when we leave home. We're physically grown up biologically, but emotional maturity wise, we all have our limits. And the idea that there is a constructive way to work on being a more mature person by better understanding the context in which we exist and not just focusing on our own feelings about things. Uh, one woman said, I used to think I've always been interested in emotions. But she said, I used to be preoccupied with what have I done to upset the other or what has the other done to upset me? And that didn't seem to get me anywhere. And what I'm now seeing based on this family systems idea is that emotions flow back and forth between people and each is responding in reaction to the other. And it gets the more the anxiety in the system, the more out of control it gets. And seeing that flow of emotions has really been the transition for me. She was working on the relationship with her daughter and made a lot of progress on that uh, as she began to see that how she was an anxious person too, not just the daughter, and how her anxiety colored her interactions with the daughter and vice versa. I mean, everybody knows it's not great to, to anxiously deal with other people, but it ne never does any good to tell people to stop worrying. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get them anywhere. It's, how do you go about doing that? I'd say fundamentally, it's through gaining a new understanding, a new way of thinking that you can then translate into a new way of being that works for you and works for the other person. So you might have answered this already, but what is the average length of treatment for somebody working with a family systems therapist? I've seen probably three, 4,000 families over the years, and it's a huge range of, of uh, possibilities of how long people want to stick with it. For me, I chose to make it a lifetime experience. I don't see a therapist anymore. Once you get Bowen was my coach for a few years, and then I worked with him for 20 years, which was very valuable being around him and his efforts to represent theoretical thinking in his own behavior, which we call in the theory differentiation of a self. So I, I didn't have regular coaching sessions with him, as we call it in Bowen theory, but um, I eventually knew the theory well enough that I could apply it in my own life without having to talk it over with somebody else. And uh, I was fortunate that my wife was working on this in her life as well. And, and sometimes in a family, one person will see what's going on better than the other. And that can be a different person over time. So like in raising our kids, which were, I, I, I think the purpose of having kids is to 
for the parents to be able to learn about their own immaturities. <laughs> but there were times when I saw the anxiety in the system in me and in the system and sort of led the way in acknowledging that and relating to the others in a different way, not trying to change them, but trying to grow up myself and get myself under better control, which allowed me to be involved without, you know, trying to change the other person and in a calmer way, which is always useful to the other person. Uh, and she could, there were other times where she saw it first and I was the director of the Bowen Center. I was supposed to see it first, but <laughs> it didn't work that way. Even though you're considered an expert, it, you can be blind to so many things. But that the uh, Hidden Life of Trees is a book I read by a, a forester over in Europe. Excellent book, The Hidden Life of Trees. And that's where I got the idea. And there was another book before, The Hidden Life of Dogs. That was Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, I think. The author likened what went on in the trees to a, a family, that the, which you don't see it because a lot of that, that's underground in the root systems and they're constantly signaling back and forth to one another, but this can be studied. And it's the same thing with the human family. There's a lot of signaling back and forth that people are responding to without being aware of it, putting pressure on one another in one sort of way or another. I think I still probably evaded your question. No, I, I think you're saying this is a lifetime process of learning. It can be. And can you explain that whole theory of differentiation just for a non-professional, which I think is a key theory? It could be the most important concept in the theory. The, the triangle, for example, I talked about earlier is very important for seeing the undifferentiation. I like to say that the purpose of family therapy is to see how undifferentiated you are, meaning how much you operate in reaction to the people around you and vice versa, and coming to know that in yourself, trying to do something about it. So the ultimate in Progress would be, and this is a Bowen phrase, that you reach a point where you're as interested and invested in the welfare of other people as you are in your own welfare. Another way of saying that would be mutual respect or how, like with my wife and I, when the kids were having some struggles, to be able to sit down with each other and talk about the situation without fear of the other getting reactive. and and it's turning into an argument. People want to talk, but it's so easy for it to slip off the rails. It means to being able to be a self in the sense of you can be guided as much from within in the form of being able to regulate your own behavior while in close contact with other people, and they can ideally do the same. Bowen called that an open relationship, and that differentiation is one way of, of getting there. I know that's a very poor explanation, but it's, uh, it's not individualism. It's, the theory calls it individuality. It's not rugged individualism. It's, you can still be, think for yourself and act for yourself accordingly in the midst of an intense, anxious situation, whether it be in the family or at work or wherever. Most people find it a little easier to do in the workplace because it's less personal usually. But we all know the workplace can get pretty intense too. And, a lot of business people, organizational people of one kind or another have picked up the ideas and tried to apply them to the workplace relationships because they're very similar, just usually less intense. That's a good way to say it. it you know, you're, you're an individual within a system. You can have agency as an individual and be a part of the system because we're interdependent. Right. I, I sometimes use a metaphor of a ship. You know, ships have these uh, compartments. That so if one compartment, the ship springs a leak somewhere, that the water can be contained in one compartment. If they didn't have compartments, it would start f flowing back and forth and filling the whole hull, and the ship would become wholly unstable. And that's what can happen in a family. How, how can a family member be going through something that promotes or triggers anxiety in them that makes sense? problem at school, problem in a relationship, problem in the workplace, and not have that infect, infect in sense of get, draw reactivity, anxious reactivity from other members of the family. And they can convert an individual's anxieties and, and problems into 
it becoming a family thing. And when it becomes an anxious family, they're no longer a resource. You're trying to make the family a resource rather than a source of stress to its members and differentiation of self by preserving individuality, thinking for oneself in the group and not reacting, for example, automatically to try to relieve the feelings of the moment. It can help in interesting ways to stabilize the system and be beneficial to the thinking of everybody in it. So what skills, habits, or tactics can patients, families, and therapists adopt either during their sessions or in between sessions to improve the effectiveness of family systems therapy? Well, I'd probably be repetitive here, but again, it's what you're trying to teach is a way of thinking, not teach what to think. It's teaching how to think. And that how would be systems and emotional, understanding the role of emotion in human behavior. Franz Duvall has just written a beautiful book, The Primatologist, called Mother's Last Hug. I would recommend it to anybody. I know Franz a little bit and always respected, but he just shows how much we humans are like other forms of life and particularly in the emotional realm and the feeling realm. But anyway, it's trying to, to uh, develop this way of thinking, and you do it by trying to apply it in your own life. And then the therapist's job is to try to represent this effectively to others. Uh, I remember a family I saw with an acting out teenager, and I was seeing the parents, and I had seen the young man from time to time. But he was getting himself into a lot of trouble. And I, I went to the blackboard I had in my office when I was in Washington, and I drew the triangle. And I put a square for the father, a circle for the mother, and then down below a square for the son. And I put uh, on each, next to each person, one third, one third, one third. I said, the problem here in your family is one third, one third, one third. And the father said, well, Dr. Kerr, you're close. But he got up and erased the one-thirds and put in one-sixth for the father, one-sixth for the mother, two-thirds for the son. <laughs> I had to laugh. And he said, that's the way it works in our family. And I never did sell them on a different point of view, although they came coming because I think they liked the neutrality. Uh, I was interested in them. Uh, one time I asked them to do a videotaped interview for a conference, and the mother said, you just want to show off one of your failures. <laughs> I mean, they weren't proud of themselves. They kind of knew that they were having a hard time changing. And, and each was kind of hoping the other would do it. Yeah, it's that getting past one-sixth, one-sixth, two-thirds, and seeing one-third, one-third, one-third. And that's the way of thinking. But you have to convince yourself that that, in fact, is true. When the emotions are high, it's just hard to think that way. So what are the most common obstacles or missteps that prevent therapists and patients alike from seeing the full benefits of family systems therapy? At the National Institutes of Mental Health in the early research, Bowen talked about op observational blindness. And I think that is the biggest obstacle. It's hard to see what's right in front of your eyes. And it's miraculous almost when you can see it, like I described with that thing with my wife. Another example of that would be um, with my mother, long story there, but I came to realize all of the sudden in an interaction with her, I had this thought come into my head, this woman is bloody well capable of taking care of herself emotionally. And for years, I had been treating her as if she was fragile and couldn't do it. If I didn't act a certain way in relationship to her, she would get upset and go into a kind of meltdown that I dreaded. and. I, I, I was years in realizing it was really seeing her as fragile that was really hanging me up. There were other things too, but that was big. And once I saw her in that way, I was able to be much stronger in dealing with her. Other details, but the next morning she came down the stairs after sleeping. And uh, as she gets to the bottom of the stairs, I'm there. And she says, Michael, are you still mad at me? And I said, Mother, do I have reason to be, still have reason to be? And she said, Michael, finally, you told me what you think. And from then on, our relationship was 100% better. I was less anxious around her, more available, less inclined to distance. And uh, it, it made a huge 
difference. And so it's in the way of people, I think, seeing the full benefits of it's it's being unable to see these patterns that unfold. Uh, and that's where observational blindness comes from. But the, with a therapist who's been down that road, him or herself, who can lay it out in a interesting and neutral and effective way, people can pick up these ideas and use them for themselves over time. So can you share any poignant examples of where family systems therapy had a major impact in someone's life without, of course, sharing any identifying information? In my book, I wrote I had a long quote from this woman with her permission. It went back to that emotions flowing back and forth. She got the idea. She was struggling in the relationship with her 32-year-old daughter, only daughter, divorced mother. She had raised the daughter since the daughter was 10 and father had been on drugs. And But as the daughter grew into adulthood and moved on with her life, she seemed to keep her mother at a distance, did keep her mother at a distance. And that really bothered this mother. She wanted to do something about it. And somewhere along the way, she liked the idea of using humor. Not everybody needs to do that, but she came up with an idea. I think I might have helped her shape the idea. I don't remember the details, but she routinely, she said, I would call my daughter when I hadn't heard from her for two to three weeks. And I'd say, hi, it's mom. I haven't heard from you. I'm just wondering, wondering if you're all right. And she eventually realized that was her anxiety she was asking the daughter to solve. And so she called the daughter, got her voicemail, fortunately, it worked better. And she said, hi, uh, we've been out of touch for several weeks. I just wanted you to know everything is fine with me. Didn't want you to be worrying about me. <laughs> well, you know, that worked. I mean, she saw that her anxiety would le lead to her expecting the daughter to reassure her about how the daughter was doing. That, that was designed to calm herself down. And by making a, a, a joke of it of sorts, but she, she meant it. I mean, it, she really saw that I've been asking her to take care of my anxiety by being certain ways with me. And I realized it just, she just distances. She can't deal with my expectations very well, and understandably so. And I could go on with, you know, many, many tiny examples like that. But I think that highlights the, the process. They're almost, Bowen used to talk about the, the emotional logic, that it's hard to approach a relationship in a rational way when it's not rational. So the anxiously driven relationship, it's not based on rationality. It's based on emotionality. And emotions follow their own logic. So when she said to this daughter, it was counterintuitive to say, you know, just some people call it manipulative, but you're trying to manipulate yourself more than anybody and make yourself a, a person who is a little easier to, to deal with or whatever is required. Over the years, I've had many examples in my own life and many examples in the lives of my people I've seen. And in, at the family center, we always, everybody knew a lot about each other's families. We usually, we did presentations about what we were doing, what we were working on. The idea being that if a th therapist is going to be effective, he or she has got to deal with things in her own or his or her own life. Freud said the same with psychoanalysis. You'd need to be analyzed so that you can be a better analyst. And, but it's, Bowen did not recommend psychoanalysis. I would have done that if I stayed with psychoanalytic thinking. But still said, you know, you need to, a therapist has a responsibility really to work on this in his or her own family so you can be useful to others. So we all knew about our families and, and we, in many ways, learned from each other's experience over time. That's great. So who is family systems therapy not appropriate for? Well, I would say that people who don't buy into letting go of blame and self-blame. Uh, I remember a fellow I saw when I was in the Navy, and I was encouraging him to deal with his family. He said, the only way I would ever go deal with my family is to rehabilitate them. <laughs> I got such a kick out of that. I mean, he, he, some people just don't see it that way. It's hard to let go of cause and effect, and the problem is really in the other person, and they're causing me to be the way I am. And again, that 
everybody knows you for centuries you can't really change others you can only change yourself but i don't think there is i think what the theory is added is more successful way of getting there you know some people just don't buy it and i know when i was a resident in training there were one or two residents that just thought bowen was terrible that he was just uh, self-centered stuck in his own agenda and others were more neutral about it but didn't really pursue it and then two or three of us out of a group of eight were serious about it and and went in that direction to one degree or or another it's got to make sense to the person a lot of people use the word resonate i remember one mother said when i heard this theory it just resonated i asked her what that meant exactly and she said well i just it just seemed to fit with my own experience i mean that's the beginning with other people it's just no sale i remember talking to a neighbor of mine uh, my book was reviewed in a local newspaper guy did a nice job and the wife was real excited about it and was trying to explain it to the husband he was pretty reactive i think about the idea he said well you've got to hold people accountable for their actions you just can't excuse them which i'd agree with that that's the peculiar thing about systems theory is on the one hand it helps you appreciate how little control people really have over their emotional functioning the limits at the same time people do have to be held accountable for their actions and people can certainly get into trouble at both ends of that spectrum because parents for example of an acting out teenager part of the problem is they're all over the kid trying to get the kid to be different but on the other hand they're usually wholly permissive letting the kid not holding the kid accountable you see a lot of this now in in the popular press about snowplow mothering helicopter mothering snowplow is the newest one i think this recent example with parents paying millions of dollars or whatever it was to get the kids into college under false pretenses paying off people I mean, horrified people but it's an exaggeration what we're seeing today i would say is an exaggeration of what's always been it's just more of it and it's more intense this uh, and understandable i mean when a mother thinks her offspring is under threat she's going to protect that offspring and anxiously protect that offspring you see it in other species when the, when the crowding gets high and rhesus macaque colonies monkeys the mothers become more protective of their offspring and when the density drops again in their typical cycles they let them go and and interact with families nearby families and related when i learned about that that was helpful to me and i think in our current society you know anxiety is in the air and there's an anxiety driven process affecting the kids in the way it's described by snow plowing and all that helicopter uh, but it's an exaggeration i think of what's always been that's very interesting so what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today well personally i um uh, have long been interested in the interplay of emotion and physical illness but all clinical problems and what i think is two things two trends one is you know the mind body dichotomy really i think has been bridged i mean the pathways that can turn a psychological threat into a disturbance in gene regulation some unfavorable disturbance in gene regulation and how that is mediated how does it get from threat psychological threat to an alteration of what your genes are doing is now pretty well known and i think that's important because it shows that way the way people interact you know has profound effects at all levels emotional emotional changes you know affect certain physiological changes and the whole body is is involved the other thing i think that's happening is with the field called systems biology and also systems medicine that is beginning to emphasize something that's been known for a long long time but not emphasized and that's the context in other words to understand a given illness in the body you have to understand the context of the surrounding tissue environment and you know it used to the thinking used to be that you could if you studied a cancer cell in a laboratory long enough all its innards and workings you would eventually understand what causes cancer 
and for the longest time, mutated genes were considered, you know, oncogenes, as they were called, were considered the cause of cancer. And now they have found so many genes that one of the pioneers in that field has come out and said, there are so many mutations in a cancer. We don't know what the heck it's all about. We're very confused. We have no theoretical frame for this. Meanwhile, there are people now saying that you've got to look at the context in which the cancer is developing, the surrounding tissue. And I would say the surrounding body as a whole and the relationship system of that person. So I, I think ultimately it's going to be science that supports the accuracy of applying systems thinking at multiple levels, uh, just like in the physical sciences, systems thinking exists throughout the physical sciences. It seems harder to bring it in. I remember talking to a very well-known biologist, and I respected this guy very, very much. And he was at a conference we were holding, and I said to him, well, do biologists ever talk much about the family? Oh, he said, we, that's too complicated. We don't touch it. <laughs> But they're beginning to touch it. And, and I think um, those, you know, I've been at this for a long, long time. And I'm sort of at the twilight of my career, I guess. Well, I don't like to admit that. It's nice to see that the chances of, of these ideas really making a difference in the world. And we know the world right now needs a lot of help. The science is moving in that direction. That's what I'm most, it'll help mental health. It'll help physical medicine in general, but it'll also be good for psychiatry, be good for society, and yet help us, I think, live in har better harmony with one another and also in better harmony with, with nature, that systems has the potential to help people do that. So if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would that be? Well, I would say let go of pathology mode, see the continuum of human functioning. Like in my brother's case, called schizophrenic, I don't think it was a very helpful term. Didn't explain a lot. Pathology mode is you know, looking for the problem inside the person. Oh, so-and-so's acting this way. Uh, you know, he's bipolar. That's why he's acting this way. Or so-and-so has got attachment issues or something that puts the problem in that individual. And descriptively, it's accurate that people have attachment problems. But if you study the relationship attachment they're having problems with, it's always two sides to the story. It can get so extreme sometimes, it doesn't look that way. Like if you have a bully sort of beating up on a no-self kind of wife, because bullying is a no-self position too. You're just trying to force the other to be the way you want them to be so you can feel better about yourself. Uh, but letting that go and... Uh, if I had a magic wand to do that, that's what, what it would be. And, and to see the continuum, again, to see a schizophrenic person has the same emotions we all have. They're not different. It's just they're an extreme on a continuum. And there's a way to understand through family process how people get there. Uh, but I say these things and I realize, I know when I finished this second book, I thought, who the heck is going to believe this? <laughs> I'm just writing as if I know what I'm talking about. I think I do, but I also am honest in saying I might not. And if somebody came along with a better theory, I would like to think I would embrace it. I think that all the research on expressed emotions and families, patients suffering with schizophrenia treated and comes back to the family. And if there's a lot of expressed emotion, it can actually not improve their symptoms. It could, you know, the family system plays a big role in that. Yeah. And also it, it overrides medication effects from what I understand. So how can my audience learn more about your work, either online or in print? I mean, we, we know about your new book. Do you have a website or anything like that? The organization I'm head of now, Bowen Theory Academy, we do have a website. It's uh, dot org. And it's really an internet organization. And uh, one of the things we do, I do a monthly webcast from here in my office on the island. We now have good cable service coming onto the island, and, and that's improved it a lot. So that, that can be a resource for people to kind of look at what some of the thinking is. But the, the reading, Bowen's original stuff is was in his um, family therapy and clinical practice. Some people find that harder to learn from 
because it, it's not a book. It's a it's a collection of papers. I think the reason my book was popular is that it laid it out from start to finish as a, a theory as a whole. And this second version of what I was writing about, I like to tell people, what do you, they say, what, well, what's your second book about? I said, I only know one thing. It's about that. <laughs> and that's Bowen theory. I consider myself narrow in that sense, but fortunately, Bowen theory applies in a lot of areas. But reading uh, it is, uh, is a good way to get introduced. But um, having contact with people who have a little better understanding, who've been down that road before and understand some of the obstacles you run into, uh, that's invaluable as well. Somebody who can do that and represent it. And I gained so much from being around Bowen for 20 years, but eventually I had to make it my own. And that's why I wrote this last book. It's what I, what I think Bowen theory is. It's not necessarily exactly what Bowen said, but I don't think there's anything terribly inconsistent in it. Uh, there are a lot of the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family, where I directed for many years. It, that was the, originally the Georgetown University Family Center. Became We eventually, after he died, we, with the permission of the family, we put his name on the organization. They have a lot of audiovisual kind of stuff. They have a website as well, www.thebowencenter.org. And they, you can see that some of the resources they have for learning. And we've always, whether people are in the profession or not, have always encouraged those people to be part of programs. This is not just for clinicians. It's for anybody who takes a serious interest in their family and wants to understand better. I wish we had more to offer at this point. Uh, but it is still, I would say the ideas are not in the public consciousness the basic idea of applying systems, getting beyond cause and effect, even though people have known that since the late 1800s, that that would be a good idea. But it's just not in the public consciousness. So it makes it hard for people to learn this when a climate that's very much about cause and effect thinking, finger pointing, polarization, blaming, all that. I guess that's all I can put in on that. Well, and that's what I'm trying to do is, is bring to the public, to the consumer, your ideas and, and others that are, that are evidence-based, research-based, and we know work. So Dr. Kerr, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people you have helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of family systems therapy. Well, at the, I admire what you're doing. Uh, I respect your energy and discipline in doing this. I think it does make a very important contribution. So I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and the people around the world can benefit more from therapies like family systems therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want. 